All right, and we're live with another Coach Mike episode here. I'm Drew Zayas, your producer, joined in the studio by Mike Supervici. Mike, I'll let you introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. My name is Mike, and I lead the uh, graduate or alumni success group here at the Founder Institute. Awesome. So today we're going to be tackling a pretty cool subject, which is how to start a startup as a non-tech founder. What steps you need to take? How do you get it done? It's a question that a lot of people have because a lot of the really good founders we see in the world are non-tech founders. So let's dive right in. Do you have to have technical proficiency to start a tech company? Um, it depends, and I hate this answer, but if you're if you're building a very, 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 very technical company, yeah, it's hundred percent right. So if like the entire business is basically like because of this algorithm or this very specific type of like product that requires deep technical like you know machine learning artificial intelligence of course like there's just no other way like there's no way a, a person that doesn't have that will have a will be able to build this type of product however uh, for a lot of products that have tech involved that's not the case so let's say you're building a marketplace most marketplaces don't require a lot of tech it, it basically if you think about what a marketplace is 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 a place where people can facilitate transactions or things like that. You can do that even manually, just like they used to do in the olden days where people would just go to the market and barter for things and stuff mm -hmm. like that or whatever, right? And then you can add a little bit of a website to do so. And in that case, like the, the technical component is just not as important. It's more about like how you acquire people and things like that. So it really depends on the business. But if you're not a, a technical person and uh, have experience in a place that requires pretty good tech or has a vision for a tech product that don't you shouldn't let that hold you back you should just be uh in a position to just recruit people to do so and we can talk about that i'm sure yeah so do you think in that case it'd be a good idea to get a tech co-founder i i don't really believe you should get a tech uh co-founder uh because uh some you know, publication or some fund out there says that you should do that. Um, you know, finding a co-founder, as I've mentioned in previous podcasts, is kind of like getting married and you want to make sure that that's a good person. You're almost better off being a solo founder than, you know, marrying a bad co-founder and ultimately that will lead to divorce, which will kill the company. So, no, but you should be recruiting technical people to join your company. And these are people that join your company and your mission. And maybe at some point they become co-founders. That's that's also an ob obviously p potential opportunity. But, you know, uh, it's it's just, you know, these are people that believe in the mission that are there working with you and, 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 and iterating. We're not, I'm not talking about like consultants here, right? That are like purely transactional. Hey, I pay you for this, you give me this. I'm talking about people that believe in, in you, believe in the vision and they wanna make this happen. Yeah, so I kind of wanted to dive into first steps for uh, non-technical founders. So let's say I'm a non-technical founder. I have this really cool idea. It's going to take some tech to build because most things do. Uh, and w what should I do? How should I approach building an MVP for this, outlining an MVP that like I could achieve as an individual? Should I bring in outsourcers for my MVP? Is that too early? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm a big believer in in the Founder Institute model here about um, the way the the we kind of like try to help companies uh, think this think through this. Look, I mean, before you even go out and build code, and this is for technical and non technical people, you really should think through kind of like the business and how you acquire customers and things like that, because that's going to influence the product that you build, right? Like if you're going to acquire customers. Um, you know, uh, virally, let's say, that means that the product needs viral features and things like that to be able to do it, right? So, you know, the first thing you want to kind of think about is kind of what the pain point is of the customer and, and go through that entire exercise, figure out who the customer is, what their needs are. Then eventually you can, you know, uh, figure out how to go out and build the product. Uh, once you have that, um, you know, what are the next steps? So maybe we can start. Right. Oh, okay. We, yeah. we can put that in as kind of like the baseline, right? So mm -hmm. you know what to build now, basically. You know, like at least what you should build initially, right? Um, if and, and you're not a, a technical person. Well, a couple of things. Um, you, I, th this goes hand in hand with recruiting people, by the way. So it, it, in my opinion, you need to really educate yourself on how to build stuff. That doesn't mean you should be good at building 
But at the very minimum, you should do some code academy to understand how code works. I think you should do at a very minimum, uh, play around with mock-up software and stuff like that to, to really model out how this uh, product works in, 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 in detail. Um, you know, definitely, definitely should create like some sort of a spec for your own sake, right? Just you could really understand, like if I select this button, it goes to here, and if it goes to here, it goes to here. And thinking through all these different workflows to your product, and obviously you'll be like, oh wow, this is way too complicated, it shouldn't be this way, right? You need to familiarize yourself with that so that you can actually speak with uh, various other um, you know, potential people that may join you and really truly explain how the product works and why this is so important. Um, and also uh, understanding it end to end, like what are the different parts? Like this is what the database does. This is what the front end does, all these different things. And, and it's important for you to at least familiarize yourself on a high level with those concepts. Yeah, and I think we're touching kind of on the tip of the iceberg of like where you actually run into problems, which is in the product development phase. Sure. And and I kind of wanted to talk about how to how to mitigate some of that and how to work around not having a lot of technical skills beyond just learning, you know, like very basic coding. First up is you're going to have to bring someone on at some point. Uh, should that be in-house or outsourced if you're turning an MVP into a product? Yeah, it's at the earliest stages, it's always better to have somebody in-house just because it's difficult to, to iterate quickly with, with the contractor. So the way a contractor or an outsourcer works is like this. You create a spec, you give the spec to the contractor, and the contractor develops that for you. Then you launch it. Then uh, you see if it works or it doesn't. Most likely it won't work. Then you fix something. Then you go back to the outsourcer. Then you give them the spec again, rebuild, right? So then we're looking at like, you know, an iteration cycle of months in the best case scenario weeks, right? And ideally what you want to be at is weeks. You know, it's like weekly. So when I have, when our companies have teams of people working on stuff, I'm getting like, you know, uh, betas and alphas on test flight you know, uh, on a regular basis, right? So, you know, I just, I literally just got one the other day from one of our portfolio companies, Tempugo, right? Like just working on uh, this product called Waitex, uh, which kind of saves time from waiting in lines, right? It's just like, bing, bing, bing. It's like, it's like every week, they're just like notification, notification, and it's even faster, right? So, um, you know, like those things are, are, those things are important. Like the faster you can iterate, the faster you can move. So the better, it's be, you're better off trying to find people in house. Now, you know that goes. Uh, you've got you got to balance that against the fact that you might not have anybody, right? And so you want to try to, you do want to try to make progress on your business while you're recruiting people, which can take some time. So you know, in some cases, uh, it may it may help for you to validate some of your assumptions with like a very raw MVP that requires very little code and things like that, so that you can really like de-risk the value prop even more. Hmm. If you do end up going with this kind of like outsource route or maybe remote work route, how do you manage those technical projects as the founder? Yeah, I think I, I want to separate the remote with with okay. the with, with, with the contract, outsourced. with the okay. outsourced. Okay, so let me start with outsource and sure. then we can go to like the remote because okay. there, there there is quite a bit difference. So with outsourcing, everything is built based on the spec. So you need to create a very detailed spec. The more detailed your spec is, the more accurate the quote is. I can't tell you how many times founders send us like a like a quote that they got from like some outsourced developer, and it's like, wow, your product's like three thousand bucks, and then I look at their spec, and it's like super vague, mm. right? And it's like, nah, nah, there's there's no way. Like this person is clearly like you know like not understanding what you're trying to build, right? right? It's all like front end stuff. Possibly, yeah, basically, uh, but mostly, uh, but also even with like really good like contractors that actually kind of understand that you don't know the back end work that's involved and they try to spec that out, it's still not detailed enough to where mm -hmm. I understand like, so it starts with the design, right? Like in your case, like if you're technical, if you're not technical, you need to be a good product person. You need to become a good product person as a part of this. So a good product person can set schedules really well, starts to can set can start to understand kind of when things go are going in the wrong direction. We'll cover that later. And then also as a non-technical person, you probably need to be pretty good with mock-ups, right? So you should be able to do des design mock-ups, do a very, very detailed spec. And then what you want to do is start like talking to contractors, 
getting bids and things like that to ensure that like the timelines and everything kind of like match up, right? And then you ideally want to create some sort of payment structure with those contractors to ensure that they're basically delivering on time. So, uh, I mean, obviously you don't want to give them the full amount right away, right? You probably want to give that in some sort of installments until they reach this build. Um, the most important thing that you should remember is that a, a contractor needs to show you that this works in production. If you don't understand what that means, don't worry about it. Just say you everything that they show you needs to be shown in production, right? So what ends up happening is, is that sometimes the code works really well on someone's own computer, for example, uh, or laptop, whatever. Uh, but, uh, you know, it might not actually work well on the live server or wherever the application is hosted, right? And so sometimes what happens with, uh, you know, contractors is like, oh, look, look, it's working. The demo is working great, but it's like working live uh, on their on their own laptop or something like that. What you want to be able to do is show it that it's actually live, working live in the way it's supposed to work live, which is hosted somewhere. So, you know, you want to have milestones around this, around actual delivery, right? Otherwise, there's because there's a big time between like, uh, you know, the amount of the, when, showing something in kind of a demo format and then doing all the things necessary in order for that application to actually work in a live environment. So a lot of the milestones that you create around uh, with contractors need to be around basically shipping something into production and having very clear understanding. Once you give somebody that spec, okay, that spec needs to basically be locked down. This is also how founders run into trouble. They start with this like spec and then they're like, well, can we add this feature? And we add this other feature and feature we add this create. feature, and this other feature. And then all of a sudden the, 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 you know, the, the projects gets delayed by six months and the, the cost goes up exponentially. They get all upset with the contractor because they're like, well, the contractor didn't say this or that, but it's like really more, a lot of it is just bad like management, right? On the founder in many cases. Right. Mm -hmm. And so this is kind of where things run into trouble. Then, you know, you got to basically, uh, make sure that it's in the contract and how you talk about that there's clear communication, meaning that every single day we talk at 9 a.m., uh, we're going to talk about this. We're going to have a daily stand up uh, on Monday and we're going to do a demo on Friday, right? Like classic, like agile is, is what I'm suggesting here. But like whatever that is, you need to have daily conversations that way that the schedule doesn't slip. So that's contractors, you know, um, as far as like remote workers, so remote is the future, and this is probably where a lot, if not all, companies are going to go. Um, the key to remote is that you need to over communicate. If you re if you don't forget, if you don't if you remember anything about what I'm about to say, is just over communicate with remote employees, meaning that you need to over explain things on Slack or Skype, whatever tool you use. Don't don't assume somebody's going to interpret that. Right. So that means you have to write more. That means you have to write things every single day. That means you can't say, oh, well, I just assumed that this person understood it because I understood it. That means you didn't explain it de in, in enough detail. So that's number one. Number two, um, always try to get that person to be on video. OK, at some point, like you cannot build a culture over like text. Right. And so you want to try to have multiple meetings uh, on, on, on video all the time in order to be able to ensure that the culture of the company that you're building is, 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 is you know, uh, something that, that's scalable. So you, you want to try to do that right away. Um, and then um, you need to use tools, right? You need to use tools like Asana or Trello or whatever project management tools to ensure that basically everybody is aligned. So, you know, uh, if you're going to create a product, you probably should look, look into agile methodology and create like a sprint. So what I like to do is like weekly sprints, you know, and we kind of set up the sprint every Monday. And usually on Thursday or Friday, we'll do like a kind of like a demo or we'll uh, evaluate kind of what's happening and things like that. And then, you know, uh, uh, push things to production or fix some things and push them to production the next week, right? So basically, if you can create some sort of cadence and a sprint, that way everybody's kind of like doing, knows what they have to do. And in every single one of these tasks, they're like very detailed and they're explained in detail so that everybody knows how, what they're doing. But don't write paragraphs, okay? Just bullets, right? Bullets so that people can understand and skim it. Yeah. How do you know if you're, you're asking too much or too little of your remote employees? 
Well, um, you can tell when you're asking too much because um, the the schedule starts to slip, mm-hmm. and you're so that's one one way possibly. Um, you know, um, if, if a lot of tasks don't get done for some reason, you can you can kind of start to see. It. This is why I think it's important to have a tool, right, where you kind of see the tasks like visually. Personally, I like that. So that that's one thing. Um, however, with engineers. One of the things that you want to make sure that you understand, like the engineer has to give you a good explanation for why the schedule is slipping, right? Because once the schedule slips one week, that means that the next week is going to be delayed, which means that the week after that is going to be delayed. So it's like you're like not going to be delayed once, you're going to be delayed across the whole um, series of sprints that you're setting up. So, you know, if, if a developer constantly misses the forecast that they make, then that's usually a warning signal that the developer uh, is not working uh, hard or doesn't understand what they're doing or that they just simply can't like estimate things very well, right? Um, One of the things I do in order to help our developers is that usually when they give me an estimate, I usually double it, right? And so that way, like there's plenty of leeway there to ensure like if something didn't go right or wrong. So if somebody tells me, I think that that's gonna take like four hours to do that feature, okay, I think it's gonna take like a day. Right. And so I, I that's that those are some of the things that I do all the time to try to kind of buffer everything. And you as the product manager needs to do needs to create some sort of buffering system. But if the schedule is still slipping after you've already buffered it by like double. Right. Then and and the, the person's constantly missing their forecast. Right. Uh, then that's usually like a problem. Right. And so then that's something you're going to have to address. Yeah. So. I know you have a lot of experience managing remote devs. You also have experience hiring them and kind of like knowing where to look. So where do you look to, to hire good remote devs and how do you onboard them? Yeah, um, well, there's there's a lot of services out there that are actually quite good. Um, so, um, you know, I want to give, I guess I've got to give a plug to TopTel, right? Like well, I've had a lot of good experience with TopTel personally. Um, they do a really good job at like screening like developers and they force developers to take like a, a, a test. So that's a really mm. good one to to look for so that you know the other thing is like a personal network so for example during in the, in the founder institute there's the the network is so large that we have a pretty good idea of who's good and who's not as particularly as, as, a, as a remote contractor you know building out your team remotely that's a whole different thing where you're like trying to have somebody join you as a potential co-founder or something right. like that or a potential employee that's that's more like running like a job search process versus like you know trying to hire a consultant yeah, so this this almost seems like a full time job itself, like between the the onboarding, the hiring, the management uh, of all of these processes. Should you just hire a project manager? No, um, and you know, as a founder, you're running multiple full time jobs all, at the same time, and your workload is really high. And you know, that's the part of, that's part of the way this goes. You know, mm-hmm. like this is this is one of the trade offs, right? Like it's like you. You have, uh, you know, uh, it's it's funny. That's why it's such a myth when people say, "Oh, well, you know, I want to I want to go and start my own business because you know I uh, set I, my own hours, set my own exactly, set my own hours, be my own boss." And it's like, first of all, you're definitely not your own boss because everybody's your boss. Your employees are your bosses. Your uh, customers are your bosses. Like every, basically, everybody's your boss, right? So you have more bosses than you ever have. And, uh, you know, it's like, as far as the time commitment, it's like, yeah, well, pick whichever one of these 80 hours uh, a week you want to work, <laughs> <laughs> right? It's like, it's, it's, this is part of the game, right? So this is, but it, it, again, that, that's why your vision is really important. Like, this has to be something that you care so deeply about that it's worth making this type of sacrifice for, right? So that's something that's more like a philosophical thing to think about. But, you know, um, Definitely don't believe that you should necessarily hire a project a, pro, a project manager or something like that. It definitely helps if you uh, can you know flank your team or yourself with like a a, a technical person that uh, you know has has some experience with with managing projects or you know if you are going to use a a uh, consultant make sure that that consultant has worked with lots of startups and you interview their startup clients and you figure out at what stage exactly they engage with them right did they engage when they were large and they were just kind of like flanking their own team or was it like the first you know it was just them by themselves and they're one one other person and that's it and that's when i do it so you got to get some references there right and so that's also like really important when you kind of think about this 
Yeah. I also wanted to touch on um, going back to kind of like the both the, like moving from MVP to product stages. Yeah. Uh, as somebody who like doesn't have a lot of technical experience, how would I pick the right technology for whatever I'm building? Like what criteria should I use? How could I identify things that don't work? Yeah, in my opinion, um, you want to use technology that a lot of people use, right? So just remember that if you don't remember anything else, right? Programming languages where there's lots of people that use them are really important. And the reason for that is because when a lot of people use this stuff, there's a lot of documentation on this stuff. So when there's a lot of documentation, that means that, uh, you know, uh, an engineer can find the answers that they need faster you know, and therefore your the, the 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 product gets built faster. It also helps you find more engineers that know this stuff because a lot of people use it, right? So if you're doing like web development, right, like you know, using like Ruby on Rails is, is probably a, a decent idea. Same thing with like you know uh, you know like like JavaScript and stuff like that. Just because you know like it's they're just very commonly used. They're very robust as well because they've been used. Uh, so much right now so it's, it's like really important that, that you do that and look for very large communities so so what do you have against visual basic nah <laughs> I don't have that much against it uh, it's, it's all good uh, you know the other thing I was going to say too is like also uh, work with whoever your engineer and lead developer is what, whatever they really want as long as they're not using like some super obscure thing that they're using just because they think it's cool um, is 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 then I would say just, you know, whatever makes them happy too, is that's also important. Okay. And so I, I kind of want to go back to uh, like vetting for remote employees. So if they do have like a good score on whatever hiring platform you're using, what could you assign them that would like show yeah. that they'd be a good fit for the technology that you're building specifically? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good one for sure. So there's services that help you create tests for... Uh, potential developers, right? So Test Dome is a uh, is a service that uh, I use a, a, a quite a few bit, where I can create like several problems that I know, and then I can kind of see how they score against other people. So that at least gives you it's like okay, this person kind of knows what they're doing, and that's like a first screener, right? And then uh, you know that that I would say that's the first step, right? Um, but honestly, like. The best thing you can do is to do like some sort of a project together, not only for you, but really for them, particularly if you're onboarding people that want to just join the mission. We're not talking contractors here. We're talking like somebody that wants to kind of like join you. You want to ensure that this is a good fit for them so that there's like alignment, right? So I would position it only almost from their perspective. Let's see if we can do a test project together. Maybe we can go to a hackathon together or something and build build something. Let's see how each of us reacts under stress and see if this is someone that you want to work with or if I'm someone that you want to work with personally, right? Because if this does end up working out and we end up choosing to kind of work together, we might be working together for like 10 years, right? And this is a big this is a big deal. So we just might as well just be safe, be safe right now, try to do some couple of test projects and, and build it and and things like that. And if you're a complete like noob, like non-technical founder, then always use that advice I gave you earlier where it's like, are they basically like reaching the milestones that they forecasted, right? And if they continue to slip on a regular basis and, you know, like the excuses are kind of the same or not as great, then, you know, you, you probably have a problem, especially if you've doubled the amount of time, right? Because that means that you have a really hard time forecasting what you're going to build, when, in which case it's going to be very difficult for you to m meet your forecasts. Yeah, and so we, we've we've touched a lot on the, like the programming side of this for like software products. Sure. Uh, how does this play out for hardware? Um, I mean, I don't I don't know that. Yeah, I mean, if, hardware is a whole a whole other can of worms, right? I mean, it's it's building the the thing initially is not necessarily easy, but it's not like the hardest part. The hardest part is building the thing at scale. Yeah, and getting which, inventory. And yeah, which means that you need to like, a lot of people need to have um, or find people that can help them, for example, in China and other places like that where they can actually go and develop and build a factory and things like that. So you do end up spending a lot of time overseas setting things up and all this, right? So 
It's different mostly because you need more money. Your iteration cycles are a lot slower, um, which is why people say hardware is hard, you know. But it still starts first with like kind of like building some sort of a prototype with off the shelf tools if you can. You know, what's happening right now is that there's a lot more spaces where there's like, you know, maker spaces, right? With like tools and like 3D printers and stuff like that. And that's usually where the first thing happens, right? And then once the first thing happens, then what you do is you generally take that thing plus the, which is part of the spec that we talked about. And then you go to like various like providers and there's like service providers like source select and things like that where basically you just go out and like like they can maybe help you actually bring this to reality and they have connections overseas and things like that where they can help you manufacture a first batch right um and so then you know that's that's a different process right Uh, but it's still um you still need some people to help you and so you're better off understanding as much as possible about how to do this in order for you to be able to speak somewhat intelligently with a person that you know may be able to join you right so you should probably learn about like what the supply chain could look like what are the parts of this thing what they do and all that okay it sounds a little like there's uh there's like less moving parts than in software in terms of like you know iterative development because like once you have your cad you can kind of like churn it out yeah i mean there, there's more moving parts actually physically right uh, <laughs> yeah. but uh but uh you 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 can say that the the, the development cycles are just slower right? okay I mean, it's just, yeah. there's just no way to, to do it that quickly um but that's what's cool about what's happening right now with all these maker spaces you can actually build a little yeah. prototype if it's a consumer product you can put it in front of people if you're doing b2b stuff that's much more involved yeah. you know and you need to go through the approval process but the benefit of the B2B stuff versus like the B2B, B2C stuff. So for those of you out there that are building hardware for like, I don't know, like a factory or something like that. If the pain point is so acute for that company, they may actually want to pre-buy the thing. And then you can use that to go run your first batch of things. And then you've got some little bit of revenue that kind of works. Then you're like, oh, well, I got a customer. I could maybe even raise some money off that. Or, you know, maybe there's enough margin there where I can go and build another batch, right? Um, or something like that, right? So it's, you know, so it's, it's, it's helpful, right, to, to have that. that. That's super enlightening. I kind of want to dive back to software, changing lanes back again. Yeah. I wanted to discuss the future of software development for startups. Are there any up and coming tools or do you think there's a possibility for tools to make this process even easier for non-tech founders in the future? Well, I mean, I can give you my personal opinion and then, you know, sure. right, on yeah. this one. My personal opinion is that we, we are going to have more one person like no code startups, mm. right? We're, we're kind of already seeing this a little bit with Airtable and, and some of the integrations. Like if you think about what Airtable is at its core, it's basically like a database, right? Um, And so the future, I think, will be where you start to see people basically hack together things based on off-the-shelf tools that are available and you can basically make them work together. If you're looking at like just the design tools right now and like, you know, Figma is like this new design tool that's like really useful that you helps you build like various like prototypes. I'm sure that, you know, that that can be uh, part of this process as well what's happening with like Squarespace, what's happening with Shopify, right? Like you can just go out and like, what's her name? Like the Kardashian, right? Like, uh, was, I don't know which one. Oh, which, I, I can't help the, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, right, she's got like a $10 billion business, right? And it's literally built on top of Shopify. It's mm-hmm. crazy, right? Like, it's wild. It's just wild, right? So I think that for a lot of you founders out there that are, are building uh, companies that do require some tech component but that's not the core value prop like there's already a lot of tools and that's only going to continue to improve i also think that moving forward the a lot of this front end stuff that's being developed uh, will continue to get easier uh to develop for like non-technical people certainly to get to a prototype certainly to get to revenue certainly to get to a point where like okay i can maybe hire somebody or bring somebody on board so i think that that's that's really important on the other hand i also think that uh, the domain expertise on the other side is, is much more important now, right? Like uh, machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence, like we haven't even scratched the surface on what we can do on that right now. It's just kind of like this overused buzzword, but it's like there's, there's so much there, right? A lot of blockchain yeah, stuff. Just a bunch of if statements. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, kind of in a way, right? Like that's there's, the, uh, there's very few companies that uh, are truly doing like 
artificial intelligence. If anything, it's mostly like machine learning, um, right. branded as. A, but anyway, that's that's a tangent. But it's a different podcast. That's a different <laughs> podcast, right? But then, right, all the blockchain stuff requires pretty deep, like technical expertise, right? So, like, there's still a huge need for all this stuff. I just think that for like some certain products, like you're going to start to be able to see like a one person thing where they basically built this thing on their own. They used Instagram to go make it go viral and crazy. And then becomes like, you know, a billion dollar business. It's just like, you know, some, some, some lady in in, in some random place that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And Silicon Valley will be dead. (laughs) Yeah. I don't, I don't don't, (laughs) don't know about that. I think the network effects here are really strong, but ultimately I do think that we're probably going to see, see that happening. Cool. So we kind of touched briefly on specs when we were talking about outsourcing and yeah. like how to deal with outsourcers. Could you define that on, on like a, actually, you know what, better yet, can you give us an example of what like a perfect spec looks like? Yeah, I can't give you an example of like a perfect spec without like, you know, showing you kind of some, some things that I've seen, but I can talk about maybe like some things that a perfect spec includes sure. like right yeah. away, right? So number one, you definitely want to have like an objective, like why are we doing this, like a section, like why are we doing this to try to really understand this. Also, really good specs tend to have what are called user stories. So customer A, her name is Nancy, she is the R&D manager for this type of company, what she does is this, 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 and that. And then, you know, this is how, uh, how she will use this product. You know, step one, she goes here using a mock-up. Step two, she does this. Step three, she does this. Step four, she does this. And then you walk through all these different workflows, and then you start to really understand from their perspective kind of how to use it. Now, if you're doing a B2B product where that has multiple, like, people that touch the product, then you need multiple customer personas, right? So uh, same thing with, like, social networks and things like that, like how to interact games and stuff like that if they're multiplayer games, right? That's a, a place to start, right? So that's number one. Number two, uh, or a lot of people like to put this as number two actually is like a definitions. Like, you know, I, I generally like to start with a persona, but it doesn't matter, right? So you mm-hmm. want to have definitions, right? Because you want to have to ensure that we all talk about the same thing, right? So what does a user even mean, right? Like it could be multiple things, right? Um, you know, what does, you know, this action mean or whatever? So then you set these up and then the rest of the document basically references these things, right? And then you basically define each feature in as much detail as possible. So I like to do it visually first because that helps me kind of get it out there. So if I'm going to go and create a mock-up of something, I'm going to create the mock-up. It's going to have this button. It's going to do this. And then I explain that in text like right below. So it's almost like a pretty poor illustration of like what your app or site would look yeah, like. Yeah, you can do this on feature. paper if you like. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's also really good tools out there, you know, like, uh, you know, I mentioned Figma earlier, um, but there's also tools like Balsamic and other stuff like that that are literally designed for this where it's just like all drag and drop and things like that. And I, I find that to be really helpful too. So we definitely, put, I definitely like putting that into a, a spec as well. And then I have something, right? So this is kind of like the ideal spec. Once you get to know a person and you've worked with that person for a very long time, like for example with, uh, you know, the the engineering team that 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 I, I work with and mm-hmm. I lead, our specs are not as detailed anymore because we all know what we're talking about because we've been working together yeah. for three or four years, right? You've probably so, like worked on the same feature. So they're page. a little bit less, a little bit less sophisticated. But initially, once you're onboarding somebody, you need to be as uh, over communicate rather than under communicate. All right. Well, it's been awesome, Mike. Do you have any parting advice for some of our non-tech founders out there? Yeah, I mean, really educate yourself. There's just like a, there's so much information now that's great. So like pick like the, the resources in that space that make the most sense. Get your hands dirty, okay? Like, uh, you know, for example, if you're building an app, Apple provides a very extensive like user interface, uh, like guideline on how to build stuff. And you know, download, for example, Xcode and play around with how they with how they work. They literally teach you how to build an app and it, it enables anybody like I mean, anybody like this no, to build like their first app using mostly drag and drop and limited amount of code just so you can understand how it works. So this is just that. But you can do the same thing with like websites and stuff like that. Hardware. If you're a hardware person, just go to like the local maker place or try to kind of put bring some things together on your at your house to kind of make this thing kind of work by 
you know, taking apart toys or whatever and building it, um, you know, just so you can understand end to end what's going on and so you can basically communicate better. And over communicate rather than under communicate with everybody. Just force yourself, right? Like it, it may be clear to you, but if somebody, if you're talking to somebody over Slack, it might not be clear. So you just got to like make sure that it's clear, make sure that you get people to understand what's going on and do that. And uh, just stay on top of the schedule. If things start to slip, you cannot allow the schedule to slip too much because then a month delay will cause an actual three months of delay from lunch, right? So just make sure you stay on top of that. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Mike. It's been awesome. Awesome. FI.co slash podcast from our episode slash subscribe for our newsletter. Thanks so much, everyone. All right. Bye-bye.